Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Fallen London. Today we are going to be looking at January's exceptional story, Fine Dining, but there's a few things I need to say first. Obviously, if you want to play this yourself, go ahead, support Fail Better, become an exceptional friend, get a bonus to your deck, extra candle, and you get to play these exceptional stories every month. Another thing I want to talk about, and this one, this one's a personal sort of interest of mine. Fail Better and Game Tea have teamed together to make a deck of cards called uh, Star Ridge's Definitely Unmarked Playing Cards. There's a man who adores playing cards and magic and all that sort of things. They are, they look wonderful. I haven't actually got them yet, but I bought them and I will let you know if they're any good or not. I assume they will be. And if you're interested, I, I urge you to go have a look because they are uniquely interesting, let's put it that way. But without further ado, let's go into the exceptional story. While walking your Ladybones Road, you stumble across an incredulous parade. First, a child, their arms piled high with folded cloth napkins. Behind them comes a young man carrying what appears to be a full set of cutlery, cheese knives and all. At the end of the street, people emerge from a recently abandoned building, each carrying similar prizes. A crowd has gathered around a note affixed to a side door. Oh, says a woman, pursing her lips. What a shame. Uh, well, let's read the note. It has been secured to the door with a silver fork. The paper is tattered, and the hand is hasty. The words have been squashed into the white space between the courses of a menu. A fine starter for, of Z muscles reads the typed header, and then below it, handwritten, I have failed. I can no longer consider myself a chef of any particular calibre. A main course of pan-seared squid, perhaps if they had come on another day, perhaps if I had been more prepared. But the delect does not care for excuses, and neither do I. I take responsibility for my failure. Mushroom sorbet? It is for this reason that, effective immediately, my restaurant will be closed, permanently. May London find its heart, the willingness to forgive my culinary miscalculations. Why do I get a feeling this is going to be an interesting story? Well, Season of Animals. Unlock Fine Dining. Uh, we can hit at an encounter at the market anywhere in London. The Market of Spite team with people. It is as you pass a grimy vegetable stall squeezed between two larger sellers that a hand shoots out and grabs your elbow. Improbably, it is attached to an illustrious chef. His eyes are wide. His white moustache quivers just slightly. I say, he says, I say, would you take a look at this? Would you credit it? You follow his gaze up to the vegetable hawker, who grins awkwardly. She holds a paper bag filled with cherries. The wax paper has been rolled down. The cherries are unnervingly red. Hmm, how back can that go? The hawker extends her arm, just slightly, for you to look inside the bag. My apologies, says the illustrious chef. I see fruit like this and I can barely contain myself. I want to reach out, you understand? Call out in a crowd. His eyes gleam. He looks up to the hawker. Do you know how long I've searched for specimens like this? A grin widens. Particularly rare, says the chef. Look at how taut the skin is. It's the flavour building up inside. Where did you find these? How did you... How did you source these? She says nothing. Perhaps you've heard of me, says the chef, turning to you. I run the kitchen at Dolly's. Impeccable cuisine, the rumours say, a waiting list of dignitaries and socialites measured in months. Have you dined with us? Uh, so we have three options here. We can either express interest in Dolly's. It's extremely difficult to acquire a reservation, especially at short notice. We can convey an interest Port cuisine does nothing for you. Fancy ingredients, barely food. Or can claim confusion. London has so many restaurants. Is Dolly's the one on the water with the chawa la creme? Let's express interest. It happens extremely quickly. The illustrious chef smiles and a pen appears between his fingers. He scrawls a few words on a card in a spidery hand and signs it with a flourish. You have a personal invitation. The waiting list, he says, and makes a dismissive gesture. I'll see you tonight. 
The hawker coughs, and the illustrious chef's attention snaps back to the cherries. How much? he says. Name your price. The hawker does. A passerby gasps, but the chef pays up. A handshake, the deal is done, and he turns to go. Tonight, he calls, at Dolly's. Okay. Seems like we're going out for dinner. Dolly's sits at the end of a narrow Vale Garden street, some distance from the main thoroughfare. Low lamps burn yellow. A crowd of 30 or 40 people bustle around a small door beneath a brick archway. Some are dressed for dinner. They pace impatiently. Others try, unsuccessfully, to catch the attention of a huge doorman who looks up as you approach. He takes your handwritten invitation, stone-faced. The doorman rings a silver bell hanging beside the door. Meet the maitre d. The crowd hushes as the door opens, and a tall man emerges, immaculately dressed and already waving punters away with a white-gloved hand. My guest list, he says. It's not some kind of suggestion. The maitre d' acknowledges you, and smiles thinly. His lips are very pale. But you, he says, come with a particular recommendation? How lucky. Do you know how lucky you are? Without waiting for an answer, he steps back into the doorway. Behind him, rather than an entrance hall, you can see a well-lit staircase descend. Do come in. The stairs descend sit deeply, and the sound from the street dies quickly away. Please excuse the crowd, says the maitre d'. He is ahead of you, the stairway too narrow to walk side by side. It's always generous, but especially so tonight. We have visitors. Is that a flicker of nervousness in his voice? The delect have sent their critics tonight. A pair of them. As in their way, I suspect some of those at waiting outside were hoping to catch a glimpse. The stairs open out into a small room, modestly decorated. You've heard of the delect, I suppose, says the maitre d'. Or seen their byline in the Gazette? Restaurant critics. The best of them, it said. Without missing a beat, he gestures towards a woman waiting behind a table. She will look after your coats or bags or... He splays gloved fingers in an immaculate shrug. Anything with which you do not wish to die. There is a moment of silence. Critics, the maitre d' says again. To gain a delect cocade will cement a restaurant's reputation. A thin smile again. Nervous. To lose one will destroy it. He strides towards a pair of double doors. We have two. Welcome, says the maitre d', to our restaurant, and in a smooth motion pulls open the double doors. Thirty chandeliers hang above fifty tables in a vast underground dining room. Its walls of polished stone are draped with bright tapestries. Dinners drip pearls, carry canes inlaid with expensive wood. Waiters glide between tables, talking in low voices on the seated patrons or pouring wine from decanters. We can enter the grand dining room. On a raised DS, a string quartet plays. They are definitely setting the scene of this being a very swanky restaurant. A dark-haired waiter passes you carrying a silver salver. The eyes of nearby diners follow him toward the centre of the room. There, whispers the maitre d', his gloved hand making an almost imperceptible gesture. Seated at the table, for two, is a large woman. Her dark hair styled with the kind of carelessness that is measured in hours and echoes. She wears a pair of reading glasses and holds a notebook at arm's length, studying it. The critic, says the maitre d', and look, her partner. Across from the dark-haired critic is an enormous tiger. An apertif is set in front of him. A tiger? Well, that was unexpected. One of the diners gets up, their excitement betrayed in their awkwardness, and touches the tiger lightly on the arm. Please excuse me, you hear the diner say. The striped head turns, a slow smile. You wouldn't sign your name, would you? 
A, a small memento for an admirer. The tiger tears a sheet from his notebook and places a vast paw print on the paper. His companion laughs brightly. Nobody ever asks me, she says, and the diner blushes. Do you think I look too mean? I couldn't possibly say, says the tiger. Wonderful. But now it's time to meet our illustrious chef. The dining room erupts into applause as the illustrious chef emerges from the kitchen. His white moustache is impeccable, his talk starched and pleated. He waves towards the applauding diners in gratitude and dismissal, and walks between the tables towards the critics. They shake hands, exchange some words, share a private joke. The illustrious chef works hard to hide his nervousness, but not quite hard enough. When he's finished, he approaches you with a smile. You came, he says. How exciting. How would you like to look in my kitchen? I'm sure the maitre d' won't mind. The maitre d' frowns, but says nothing as the illustrious chef leads you towards a pair of slated doors. There is a momentary stir as the diners see the illustrious chef lead you towards the kitchen. One woman, wearing a fascinator, leans over to her dining companion. He does this sometimes, you hear her say. Takes a shine to somebody. Her companion scoffs. We should be so lucky. In the centre of the room, the tiger catches your eye, just for a moment. Leans over to whisper something to his companion. So let's pass through the doors. Light pours from the kitchen. The sound of the diners outside fades rapidly over the noise of the night's preparation. Plates and silverware clatter, boiling water rolls on stovetops. Waiters pass in and out. Three line cooks talk quietly. A wide-eyed man carrying a clipboard checks and rechecks the pantry. In one corner of the cavernous space, a stern-looking woman sets up her own station. Seven bags of flour, a marble rolling pin. She looks up sharply as you enter, then studiously ignores you. <laughs> Lovely. A line cook bustles past carrying a tray of knives. Good evening, she says. Flames leap from a gas burner. A line cook flicks water from her hand onto the griddle above them, which hisses and bubbles. She nods. Nearly hot enough. The illustrious chef takes in his kitchen with a sweep of his arm. My team, he says. Would you like to meet them? Sure, why not? Let's meet the line cooks. I say, calls the illustrious chef. The three young cooks look up. Apparently the backbone of the kitchen. The three line cooks form a row in front of you. One is a tall man with a red strip of cloth wound around his head. Another is a slight woman who keeps turning back to her station, anxious that a pan of milk doesn't boil over. The third, a dark-skinned woman, has brought a mortar and pestle with her and seems to be grinding pepper. Line cooks, says the illustrious chef shortly. What is there to say? Good at stirring pans and chopping meat and little else. Couldn't come up with anything interesting given five years and a cookbook. If this sentiment stings the line cooks, they have grown skilled at hiding it. Hey, everyone's got to start somewhere. Not everyone's a master chef the day they wake up. Uh, let's meet the sous chef. The illustrious chef claps the wide-eyed man on the back. He jumps. We have... we've got everything, says the sous chef before he can be introduced. As though preempting an accusation of some kind. My second in command, says the illustrious chef to you, instead. Not quite the brains behind the operation, but somewhere close to that. The sous chef makes a sudden intake of breath. Too kind, he says hastily. Much too kind. He turns to you. I've never seen chef work with a written recipe. Did you know that? Not once. The illustrious chef taps his forehead. All up here, he says. Plates clatter. The sous chef's hands are shaking, just slightly. The sous chef is showing signs of nervousness. Is that because of us, or is that because of the reviewers? And now it's finally time to meet the pastry chef. The illustrious chef coughs, and the pastry chef looks up, gestures for you to approach. I won't shake your hand, says the pastry chef, 
Her fingers are flowery. She cuts tiny diamonds of chalk pastry with a little knife. I don't mean to be rude, chef, she says, barely glancing at you. But don't you think we should be focusing a little less on the tourists and a little more on the delect outside? Ha! says the illustrious chef mirthlessly. The line cooks stare. The pastry chef sifts sugar. As I thought, she says, and shrugs, turning to you. Have a good dinner now. And now we get to listen to a listen to a sure speech from the chef. The illustrious chef claps his hands and the kitchen falls silent. I think, says the illustrious chef without preamble, that we shall cook 14 courses tonight. I deserve another delect cockade, don't you think? The sous chef has gone to fetch something from the pantry. Each more complex and delicious than the last. The line cooks glance at each other. And, continues the illustrious chef winking at you, we will be working with a twist. The sous chef returns carrying a box of cherries from the market. Sliced, says the illustrious chef. Pureed, used as glaze, turned into a reduction, pickled. One of the line cooks sighs. With every dish, the delect shall see how I transform the cherry. Bring me a knife. I must try them. The illustrious chef takes a thin slice, raises it to his mouth. His moustache quivers. He chews, almost without realising it. The sous chef places a hand on your shoulder and leans forward, excited. It is a moment before anything appears to be wrong. Then, the illustrious chef eyes widen in panic. A noise struggles to escape his throat. His hand opens, dropping the knife, then tightens into a fist. He staggers backwards against the wall, his eyes glazed, and sinks to the floor. Something terrible has happened. Dinner time! A bell rings insistently. It's time for dinner. There are a full 30 seconds of silence, punctuated by a thin, low noise of panic. It is coming from the sous chef. He... he died, he stuttered, white-faced. One of the line cooks drops to his knees next to the body, against the wall. Not dead, he says. He's breathing. The double doors swing open. I trust everyone is prepared, says the maitre d', and then stops short, holds a hand to his mouth. What? he says. What are we going to do? The kitchen falls dead silent. The line cooks look at the pastry chef. The pastry chef looks at the sous chef. The sous chef looks at you. I am not a cook. Okay, <laughs> this is going to be fun. I can feel this already. The fear in the eyes of the sous chef. Suddenly, with a kind of blinkered single-mindedness, the sous chef bolts for the door. He is stopped by the raised hand of the maitre d'. Nobody leaves, he says. And then he looks pointedly at you. Nobody. We have delect critics out there. The sous chef backs up a few paces, then turns, wide-eyed to you. In one hurried movement, he pulls his talk from his head. He speaks very quietly. Take it, he says. Take it? Do I want to be a sous chef? <laughs> we have three options here. We can take the sous chef's talk. He turns it over in his hands, crumpling it, straightening it, fiddling with the pleats. We can turn down the sous chef's offer. In a time of crisis, shouldn't the sous chef be the one to take command? He is the second in command. Or we could find an alternate hat. You're no sous chef, but perhaps a spare line cook's cap is available. Um. Oh, well, I'm not one to shy away from a challenge. Let's take his hat. Fourteen courses, he says, handing you the hat. Fourteen courses! I can't do that. He reaches reflectively for his clipboard on a nearby station. Can't find it, and shoves his hands heavily into his apron pockets. As you put on the toque, you seem momentarily relieved. Not that difficult, he says. Cooking. Any fool can do it. And he looks around wildly. You've got a whole kitchen, and all these cooks, and, and it's just putting ingredients into things, you know? As he sinks into a chair, however, the panic begins to boil inside him once again. He looks at you, wearing his hat, and then towards the dining room doors. He swallows hard. <laughs> the sous chef has attempted to abdicate responsibly. What, by giving it to a randomer? I'll be fine. The doors to the dining room swing open. 
The sous chef stifles a short cry of alarm. Standing in the doorway is a dark-haired delect critic. She raises a finger as if to say something, and then crosses the room in three quick steps and crouches beside the body of the illustrious chef. Water, she says, and clicks her fingers. And something soft to put behind his head. You poor fool. Then she stands, taking in the room with an even glaze. When she reaches you, she stops. Who, she says, are you? I am the sous chef. But no, let's, let's read them all. Protest your lack of involvement. You stumbled into the kitchen. There was a terrible accident. You don't know any of these people. We can claim that you're, the, you're new to the kitchen. You're learning on the job, hoping to improve your knife skills. Everybody has to start somewhere. See, exactly. That would have worked if I took the, sh the chef's, the, the line cook's hat. But no, we're going to have to claim with the sous chef we're wearing his hat. The sous chef abdicated responsibly and you took his place. Uh oh. <laughs> the critic narrows her eyes. No, she says evenly. I've seen too many sous chefs. You're not one of them. She sweeps past you towards the line cook. Was it cherries? I heard the rumours. A whole batch spoiled. He must have thought he was getting lucky. The sous chef cautiously eyes the critic's notebook. Are we going to lose marks for this? He says. Darling, says the critic briskly. She is fixing her hair into a bun. You don't have a chef. I don't think you have a menu. You're going to lose 200 diners. Outside, in the dining room, you can hear the sound of people chattering. The critic rolls up her sleeves. We're going to have to get to work. Wait, what? The critic is going to help us cook? Well, I suppose we could have a hasty conversation with the critic. An apron, says the critic, rummaging in a cupboard. Do you have a spare apron? The pastry chef stands beside her, arms folded. We do, she says, and then, waitly, for kitchen staff. She smooths her own dark apron with flowery hands. The critic ignores that, but smiles when she sees you approach. I suspect, she says, that you have some questions. She finds an apron, ties it briskly. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, let's inquire to the plans of the critic. Surely she isn't planning on preparing dinner with you. The critic looks about her. At a stove, the sous chef is watching a pot of water boil. He shifts from foot to foot. The line cooks have formed a small huddle around a station and are talking in low voices. The pastry chef watches the two of you like a hawk. Perhaps I'm wrong, says the critic, but I don't think you're in a position to refuse my assistance. She pulls a paring knife from a holder, tests the blade. Besides, I've had my disagreements with the head chef, but I'd hate to destroy his restaurant over some poisoned cherries. There is a frosty pause. And I could. Oh, let's bring up the original menu. 14 courses, the elevation of the cherry, no written recipes. The critic pulls a chopping board from a drawer and sets it down on an empty station. She laughs. 14 courses, we're cutting 10, no question, any more than that would be excessive, even without a poisoned head chef. She chops mushrooms derisively, her knife, percussion against the wood, 14 courses. All 14 courses tells me is that you've you have tired line cooks and too many ideas. We've got to keep it as simple as we can. Four courses, a starter and a main, and then some kind of meat and cheese plate. She glances over to the pastry chef, and then dessert, I suppose. Uh, discuss her colleague. Out in the dining room, the tiger sits beside an empty chair. Would you be worried about him? Worried, says the critic. He's perfectly safe, if that's what you're trying to imply. Unless, of course, he dislikes the meal. I, I've seen him close restaurants with a mere rumble of disapproval. The sous chef, who has been listening, turns and walks back to his station wordlessly. He steps too quick against the tiled floor. But he's a sweetheart, says the critic hastily. He is. I mean that. He's the son of some tiger prince, I think. Do you know he collects those little china figures? Milkmaids and foxhounds and portly men with square cows? I gave him a very mean-looking horse for his birthday last year. She hunts around in a drawer. He was thrilled. 
Well, let's learn about the Delect. How do they choose which restaurants to visit? Why do they always work in pairs? I try and dine somewhere ev new every day, says the critic. It's so boring to be a regular. When I find somewhere particularly impressive, well, she gestures with a wooden spoon. We'll put in bids, assign partners, and make a visit in an official capacity. She sighs. Always partners. It makes sense. One of us acts as a balance and the other. And well, not to put too fine a point on it, but diners can prove dangerous down here, can't they? She looks pointedly towards the dining room, then down at her apron. Always good to have a spare. Raise the possibility of underhanded play. Which one of the select critics working in the kitchen? Shouldn't this be easy? The wrong question. I hope you're not considering cheating, says the critic. The tiger can't abide cheating. Comes down hard on it. She leans a little closer. Do you know what happens to a restaurant that loses all of its delect cockades? Her voice is low. First, people stop coming. Then they put boards over its windows. And then, in 80 years or so, someone will visit you in the tomb colonies. Aren't you that chef who cheated the delect? I'll ask. So I'll pretend you didn't imply that. And I couldn't cheat, she says. Even if I wanted to, there's no rule book I've memorized, no set of boxes to tick. I can't guess what the tiger is looking for, but that's all it'll be. Conjecture. Ooh, how could she tell you weren't the sous chef? She had no reason to doubt you. You were, after all, wearing his hat. <laughs> she sighs, looks you straight in the eye. A useless piece of deception. Honestly, were things not so bad, I would have left. For the first time since her arrival in the kitchen, she seems piqued. You don't carry yourself like a sous chef, or any kind of chef I've seen before, she sighs. I don't doubt that you mean well, but you're going to try and pull the wool over the eyes of the elect. You're going to have to try a lot better than that. Outside, there is a sound of waiters laying out plates for a starter. We're going to have to try harder than that. Uh, let's talk to the line cooks. One of the line cooks steps forward. We've been talking, she says, and it seems like nobody's really in charge anymore. But we get the feeling that we're still the least in charge and you're somewhere near the most in charge. Another joins her. Chef was always clear, he says, about what we were. Muscle for cooking, says the third. And we were wondering, we were wondering if you felt the same way. We have three options. We can grant the line cooks more agency. Perhaps a more equitable kitchen might be just what you need. We can make no promises. The kitchen may yet prove a battlefield requiring culinary muscle. Or we can reprimand the line cooks. This almost certainly qualifies as insubordination. Remember the adage, too many cooks spoil the broth? I'm kind of worried that if I give them too much power, they're going to cause me issues in the future. So I think I'm going to make no promises. Ah, says one. Well, thank you for listening. The three line cooks make a general effort to hide their disappointment. They have almost certainly heard this exact line before. It means a lot that you'd let us speak, says another, not without sincerity. We'll get back to prep then, I suppose. On the other side of the room, the pastry chef has her head down, carefully shaking flour onto a surface. She has almost certainly been listening. At, this, at a sink, her sleeves rolled up, the critic scrubs her hands and forearms with a sharp-smelling soap. And we can now move the illustrious chef. Other than his shallow breathing, the illustrious chef does not move at all. His eyes stare straight ahead. He's paralysed, says the critic. And will be for a day or so, I believe, she sighs. The poor man. She looks down at him. You can hear me, can't you? I'm sorry, this must be very frightening. One of the line cooks approaches. What are we going to do with him? She's... She says, we can't just leave him there, can we? Uh... <laughs> we got three options. We can leave him here. 14 pre-planned courses are nothing to sniff at. Even in this state, he might prove useful. Uh, place him in the pantry. There has already been one unexpected visitor to the kitchen. What if a diner catches a glimpse? Or we can leave him in the kitchen but close his eyes. Perhaps the illustrious chef would prefer... Not to see what's about to happen. Can we not, like, put him in a bed or something? Uh... 
Let's place him in the pantry. The illustrious chef is heavy. You join two line cooks in carrying him towards the pantry. The sous chef half runs alongside you. Please be careful, he says. Don't drop him. He points uselessly at a spot on the ground. There's a little step there. You set him down amongst bags of potatoes and boxes of mushrooms. The smell of the pantry is rich and comforting. The sous chef drapes a coat over the illustrious chef's shoulders. He'll be safe here, he says, tucking in the edges. Look at all these beautiful ingredients. I hope there's nothing nasty in those ingredients. The illustrious chef sits motionless amongst the mushrooms in the pantry. And I think I'm going to have to end the episode here. We are just about to start the start, though, so that'll be an interesting start to the next episode. So, But thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And as always, I'll see you next time. <laughs>